Good morning, it's day two at PCR. Um, my name is Darren Mylott. I'm here for Radcliffe Cardiology and the Interventional Cardiology Review. I have the pleasure of being joined by Dan Blackman from the Leeds General Infirmary. And we're going to discuss um, uh, Reprise 2. So, uh, Dan, maybe you might take us through some of the unique features of the uh, Boston Scientific Lotus Valve and how that is perhaps uh, an advance on current TAVI systems. Okay. I think there are two, I mean, I would pinpoint two key elements which were weaknesses in first generation systems. One well documented being the instance of paravalvular leak with moderate grade two paravalvular leak being seen with the both first generation devices in something around 15% of cases, maybe even higher than that in some of the studies, particularly partner two. Um, so the paravalvular leak issue is one that clearly needed addressing by second generation devices. I think the second one is the uh, unpredictability seen with both first generation devices. I think with, with core valve, as an experienced core valve operator, we know that it, it, we can't exactly put the valve every time where we want it to be. Um, there's some unpredictability. With Sapien, it's, the issue is more around having one shot to put it in the right place. Slightly changed with this slower deployment technique, but still an issue. And I think that it's those two areas which the Lotus valve particularly delivers um, genuine advance in. So in terms of control of the deployment, the, the valve is extremely stable. Um, it, will, it, it, will, it will not be moving around during the deployment. You can take a lot of time if you want to and you can very precisely position the valve. Usually, in fact, your first position will, will, will be good because of the ability to take time and the stability of the valve. But you can fine tune the positioning throughout the procedure, put the valve exactly where you want it to be. And then you can assess, and if you're not happy with, with, with where it is for any, any particular reason in relation to the coronaries, or if there is heavy calcification causing paravalvular leak, you can put the valve slot somewhere slightly different um, and, and achieve an optimal result every time. In terms of paravalvular leak, it's, it is from, in my experience at least, and from the data, I think is, is almost a non-issue. Um, and I think that must be attributable to the adaptive seal on the lower half of the frame sealing those, uh, the, the, those gaps where there's frame malapposition due to calcification and preventing a paravalvular leak. And it, it's certainly, in our practice, uh, an immediate and obvious change in, in the patient leading to not worrying about checking the LVDP at the end of the procedure. We know that there's not going to be paravalvular leak uh, and that feels like a real step forward. So repositionability, which um leads us perhaps to uh, even take on more challenging anatomy than we once would have. Um, perhaps allows us to go into a lower risk population knowing that um, our acute procedural results should be better um, and the reduction in, uh, in, in paravalvular leak which uh, as you've described is, uh, is pretty impressive with this system. Um, the stable positioning and the ability to, um, to take your time with valve deployment is that does that come about through the the fact that the valve is annular and the valve is released early in the deployment procedure um, for the core valve for example when we're halfway through the procedure and the valve starts to flare the patient can become hemodynamically unstable because the valve acts as a parachute that doesn't seem to happen with the no with the lotus valve. no i mean uh, that you, you're quite right it's, it's because the valve starts to function early so in the majority of cases there will be no hypotension during the procedure um, but it's not invariable. There will be some cases, uh, perhaps particularly in patients who are already hemodynamically fragile, where you may see some minor drop in blood pressure. But in the majority of patients, as you work step by step through the procedure, you will not see any fall in blood pressure. Okay. Um, if you do see a fall in blood pressure in those rare cases, what the valve allows you to do is to put that valve in um, to close to full deployment, get the valve working, allow the patient to rest, assess the position, and fine-tune the positioning at that point if you want. So in general, you can take time. And I think what we see from the Lotus is by taking time over the procedure, you make the procedure quicker because you're not having to reposition the valve. Sure. You're not having to post dilate the valve. You're not ever having to put a second valve in. So it's a, it's a, it's a procedure which uh, rewards a kind of a, a careful and stepwise process. Um, okay. And you follow those steps and you will get a good result. Okay. Um, 
One of the other things perhaps to, to discuss um, in relation to this system um, are pacemaker rates. 28% um, pacemaker rates in Reprise 2, um, not dramatic, um, uh, little evidence if any to suggest that the addition of a pacemaker compromises long-term uh, outcomes in patients, but um, what's your feel in terms of that pacemaker rate with, with this valve? Is it a relation to uh, the, the radial strength of the valve, how low the valve is positioned, um, or is it, it, is it something else? Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting question. I think it, 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 we have to observe that not only was the pacemaker rate 28%, but in almost all those cases, pacemaker implantation was for high-grade block. Like with a lot of the systems, in the six-month follow-up data being presented at this meeting, we see that only 50% of the patients are using the pacemaker um, at follow-up. The other half have recovered AV conduction and are needing the pacemaker, which I think is an important observation. Um, in terms of the mechanism, the controlled mechanical expansion of the lotus valve does uh, impart a greater radial force on the surrounding anatomy. So I'm sure that is the mechanism. It may partly relate also to the denser uh, braid, the denser mesh of the cells of the um, lotus valve. What we've looked um, as reprised to investigators at what the predictors of permanent pacemaker implantation were, and that, that, that work was presented at TCT last year. The biggest predictor, in fact, was over, uh, was over expansion of the surrounding anatomy. So as you know, currently there are two sizes of lotus valve available, 23 and 27, um, which were used to treat patients across an annulus range of 20 to 27, um, with inevitably some pushing of those boundaries by the investigators. And that meant there was some significant oversizing in some cases, so 27 millimeter valves being um, implanted into patients with 23 and a half, 24 millimeter annuli. Uh, 23 millimeter valves going into a 20 millimeter annulus and what the analysis showed that, that when the overstretch was more than 10% when the size of the valve was more than 10% bigger in, in um, diameter than the um, actual anatomy on CT then the pacemaker rate was much higher mm. um, and the hope therefore is that once a, a bigger range of sizes is introduced to reduce the need for oversizing for over expansion and stretching of the anatomy that that pacemaker rate will fall so the 25mm valve is expected to be available in June, certainly in time for the Reprise 3 uh, pivotal IDE study. Um, that will fill up an uh, important gap in time, a 21 and 29mm valve. Sure. So I think that will bring the pacing rate down, but I think we are going to still see a pacemaker rate with Lotus that's higher than with the Sapien valve, uh, for example. Interesting to speculate and to see whether less oversizing indeed translates to lower pacemaker rate but whether it also translates to uh, more power valve or leak. I suppose that, that may well be a trade-off that... Uh, I don't think that's going to be a trade-off we're going to need to make. Um, I think what, what we've learned as operators coming from other systems to the Lotus valve is you don't really need to oversize the Lotus valve. Um, you're sizing the valve really to deliver um, effective anchoring of the device in the anatomy. And if you deliver that, a size of valve that will achieve successful anchoring, then usually the adaptive seal will take care of paravalvular leak. Okay. So, you know, we've certainly treated patients at the top end of the anatomy with annuluses up to 23.5 with the 23 valve, up to 27.5, even 28 on looking, reanalyzing the data without significant paravalvular leaks. Interesting. So I don't think we're going to see that. I think um, we don't need a lot of oversizing with the Lotus valve to deliver an effective result and to avoid paravalvular leak. Okay. Perhaps one final question. Um, how do you see this valve being integrated to the vast majority of practices that are currently Edwards or, or, or core valve uh, um, uh, practitioners? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think all TAVI operators are looking at the second generation. Um, as you know, there are several devices which have come onto the market, C marked in the last 12 months, and thinking about which of those devices they're going to use, and perhaps then how they're going to select patients for different devices. I think there are some areas where I see the Lotus valve is offering advantages. It's a, in our experience, it's extremely effective in heavily calcified anatomy, where you might expect to have a significant paravalvular leak with a device based ju just around a frame. Mm. Um, so we will be selectively using it in, in those anatomies where we think we may, with our 
previous uh, main device, um, which in our institution is the core valve, get a significant pair of valve to leap with the Lotus valve we won't. I think it may also, for similar reasons, work effect very effectively in bicuspid anatomy. Um, I think it, perhaps more than some of the other devices, offers the operator confidence in avoiding balloon dilatation prior to the TAVI. That's something that TAVI operators are increasingly doing with all systems, but because of the controlled mechanical expansion and the high radial force of the Lotus device, you don't need to disrupt the anatomy with balloon valvular plasty to effectively deliver the device. I think that will be in selected cases in heavily calcified anatomy. We basically want to uh, do a balloon valvular plasty, but we know that the balloon valvular plasty may contribute to cerebral embolization. It may contribute to AV block, so it will offer us that. I think the device performs well in horizontal aortas, vertical annuli, where with some of the existing si systems getting coaxial alignment can be challenging. So there are a number of areas where I think it offers something more. Um, and um, that's something that I think that, that, that all TAVI operators are starting to think about more and more, you know, uh, allocating specific, targeting specific de devices to specific anatomy. Yeah. That's fantastic, Dan. We look forward to, to more data from, uh, from this valve and, uh, and to, uh, to its continued success. Thanks Good. for joining us. Thank you very much.